<laughs> welcome. <laughs> what is? <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, by the you. way, that's Helen. Uh, Hi. <laughs> and this is Yotam, uh, and welcome, and welcome back, Yotam. In fact, you, you and I last met almost exactly three years ago. When on this stage. On this very stage, um, and you hinted at that time that your next project just may be a dessert or a sweet book. <laughs> Uh, so what took you so long? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's such a good book, it takes a long time to make. <laughs> <laughs> Helen and I have been, um, actually what led to this book is about more than a decade of um, hard work eating cake. And, um, <laughs> and uh, we, uh, I describe in the introduction to the book the whole process of us meeting mostly on Sundays and Helen bringing um, over a bunch of cakes and then sitting and discussing and talking. And it does take a lot of hard work to decide what you want to show the world and what cakes you like and what works perfectly. So uh, we worked about more than 10 years uh, creating new cakes and then the last two, three years just working on this book uh, in a kind of concentrated way. Well, it, it's a wonderful book. I've had the advantage of being able to um, enjoy some of the delights of it over the last couple of weeks. I tasks my partner with baking furiously out of the book as part of the, um, part of the research. <laughs> um, it's terrible. <laughs> um, very dedicated. He's very dedicated. So when we got together last time, we had a chance to, to investigate a bit of, uh, of your path to becoming a cook, but it's our first time getting to meet you, Helen. First of all, congratulations. This is also your first book. Yes, it is. Your first Thank book you tour. Much. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm going to start by asking you um, what was, has been your path to this very unusual and particular career of developing, especially um, dessert and, and pastry. What caught your... What caught your this is the it? question that I find the hardest to, to answer, actually, <laughs> because I've come to it in such a circuitous route. I actually graduated in psychology, and uh, when I left university, I worked for a ph pharmaceutical company. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are those recipes in the book, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and there is vitamin C in one There's of the There's vitamin recipes. C in one of the cakes, Good. that's right, you will see it. Um, <laughs> and part of my job at the time was to talk to doctors about new products. And one of the things I caught on to was this idea that if I provided lunch for them or catered lunch for them, that they were more receptive to listening or hearing me talk about the drugs. And I noticed after a while, not not so long into it that actually I was more interested in the lunch than the, the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and I would then begin to spend a long time sort of preparing the menu and crafting the, the lunch event. Uh, um, and eventually I thought, well, stuff that, the drugs, and I'll just focus on the lunch. And I uh, actually went to the caterer who used to cater for these lunches and applied for a job. And uh, they, they, they laughed at me. They gave me a, a try. I lasted one day. Um, <laughs> But I think it, it gave me the confidence, actually, that I knew I had a lot to learn, but it was really what I wanted to do. And um, that said, pastry and dessert is a very is a special part of, um, of any kind of cook's life. And when did it sort of, when did the light bulb go on that you, at least for this book, if not generally, wanted to specialize? You know, I, I think I loved cooking of all kinds. I mean, I grew up in a Chinese sort of food-obsessed Chinese family. And you grew but, up in, in Malaysia or in Australia? Well, I uh, spent 10 years of my life in Malaysia, but I, I did, well, I moved to Australia at 10, and, and I think when you're a migrant family like that, you spend a lot of time trying to sort of get that comfort from food, and so our lives constellated around that. Um, but I, I think for me, when I started cooking, I, I, fairly late, I guess, having done a degree in psychology, um, I was fairly insecure about it. I loved it, but I wasn't sure that I was good enough. And I think one of the things that drew me to baking was this idea that there were guidelines, there were sort of instructions. And I thought, well, I can read, I can follow instructions, and I learned <laughs> it, that way. So, yeah. It's so interesting because, Yotam, you too had an academic beginning. You were on a chart, on a, on a track, really, to follow um, at least one of your parents into an academic career. And it was actually a pastry internship, I guess, in the UK that changed your life. And so yeah. now, and now you're finding yourself back in the world of flour and sugar. And um, yeah. so what was it about that 
that experience, um, that first experience that hooked you? It's a bit like what Helen says. There is something very um, predictable in, a, in the best possible way about a, a baking recipe, a cake recipe. It's very, dis it's very detailed. You know exactly what you're aiming for and what you're doing. It's much more difficult to stuff up, really, because if you follow the recipe, uh, the size of the tin is clear, then the temperature of the oven is clear, the, long, the amount of time it's going to take to bake the cake, and then you're kind of, you're feeling you're in a, in a safe territory. And I think for someone who joins a kitchen, this is one of the most kind of uh, predict uh, predictable, I guess is the right word, the, e the most um, easy ways into a kitchen. And I, feel that, I felt that way. So when I, when I was um, studying in London, when I learned how to cook, I went in the evening to this restaurant that I thought I'd have to go to a Michelin star restaurant, of course, because that's where you learn That's where uh, you things. begin. Um, <laughs> not <laughs> <laughs> that to be clear, you were going as a patron to eat, or you were, you were No. <laughs> <laughs> I never ate there, but I, said, I went to the chef, and I said to him, well, look, I'd love to work here in the evenings. And he said, well, go, well, you know, that's fine. Go speak to the pastry chef, because that's what they do. They, go, they dump them, you on someone else. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, well, it, that's fine. You can whip up the egg whites during service for the souffles, because you can't do that in advance. I mean, that's the one thing you, can, you cannot prepare. So I, she, she put me in a corner, and she said, well, every time I've got a souffle on order, you whip up the egg whites. <laughs> and that's what I did for about two months. I just whipped up egg whites for souffles. <laughs> and, um, and it was, um, I can honestly say that I'm an expert in, <laughs> in that <laughs> bit of the, of the kitchen. And, uh, but ironically, or not ironically, I ended up um, whipping way more egg whites later when, I, when we opened Ottolenghi and we started you know, pay, putting meringues in our windows and it has become almost like the symbol of the, mm. of the Ottolenghi window. Those big piles of meringue, really kind of fist-sized meringues with either um, with chocolate or cinnamon or raspberry, and they're you know they're visually very effective and really they've become kind of synonymous to the Otolengi, Otolengi shops. And that's just you in the back whipping all the. <laughs> 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 Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really you, you collaborated with um, your your uh, business partner Sammy on uh, the Jerusalem Cookbook. So you you have an experience working to develop recipes together with others, and and your whole. Your whole approach is a collaborative one. And nonetheless, because as you both say, baking is kind of precise, I want to know what does a collaboration between the two of you look like when you're coming up with the recipe? Um, it's quite easy to describe, isn't it, I think? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> is it? <laughs> well, we're always talking about food. And so the line of demarcation between sort of conversation about children or about the business and about the analysis of a cake is sort of all in one bowl. Yeah. But, but I, I think we were quite disciplined when it came to the making of the book. We had to be because, I, I, you know, there's always all the other stuff going on apart from the book the running of the restaurants. But is, it's, um, is, is it sort of like music and lyrics, like which comes first? Would you come up and say, I think this is going to be good and you would taste and revise or vice yeah, versa? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, yes, we, had yes. a, we, have, we had a procedure. And uh, normally Helen would, um, so Helen uh, works from home and she would uh, test a, a cake or, or a biscuit or a dessert, whatever it is in the book that he, she was doing for the first time. And um, many of the recipes are actually Ottolenghi products, but uh, you know things that have been on our counter for years. About 50% of those of the recipes in the book. But it's some, one thing to cook it in a, at ho uh, in a restaurant or in a deli, and it's another thing to make it at home. So Helen, even those recipes had to kind of go to the to the beginning, to the basics, and try them in her home kitchen. And once she's been she'd been satisfied with with what she'd made, she would send it over to me. And I have a test kitchen where I try all my recipes, and I would try it there. And by the time that had been tried a second time in the test kitchen, Helen would come and we would sit around and say, okay, does that work? And what does it do? And whether, we're, whether we love it. And love is a very strong word, but it is really almost about that, because every one of the cakes or, the, or, or sweets that we have in the book, has, we have to love it. Yeah, it's a almost a visceral sense that, oh yeah, this really hits this the is, spot. This yeah. really makes sense. And, and can you uh, take an example of, of one of the recipes, maybe it's a galette or a cake or something, where you, you knew you were close, but you, di you weren't there, and, w and how you figured out what needed to happen next? Every time it's a different thing. I yes. think uh, every cake has a different story. So for instance, I would, I would, uh, there is um, one, some cakes, 
or some sweets are easy to um, kind of be happy with quite early on. So you kind of try it one or two or three times and you say, okay, well, that's, that works. You know, and then you're happy and then you can put it to the yeah, side. Yeah, each one had such a different story. I mean, there's, a, there's a good, the, the, the marble cakes, which the marble are, cake, I mean, we're, took we're a long time, of, didn't they? Well, they took a long time, which is surprising in one sense, because the base recipe comes from Rose Levy Berenbaum, whose mm -hmm. cake Bibles we love. And, <laughs> and she talks about, she, you know, she says it took her seven years to perfect this cake. And we thought, well, why would we not build on that? I mean, we see recipes as a kind of conversation. You know, somebody, I mean, I guess perhaps it's from our academic tradition, where there's no shame in, you know, if you have a thesis, there's no shame in sort of look at, looking at who, who has had something to say about that previously. You extract from that, you put your little bit to it, and you put it back into this sort of repository where other people can sort of join in the conversation. So Rose had this cake where she, you know. Just describe a, a marble cake. What's, what, is, what distinguishes it from something else? Well, a marble cake is basically colors that are swirled together. Um, and, and we started with the pound cake, Rose's perfect pound cake. And we wanted to add what we called sort of otolenghi flavors, which in this particular case was coffee and cardamom. And although it seems simple enough. <laughs> <laughs> do, do we need a break? Do we need a moment? <laughs> I, and then there was this kind of sort of weeks of discussion about whether we use espresso coffee. Uh, does everybody at home have a coffee machine? Well, no. So perhaps we use instant, instant coffee. Which and is so interesting because I looked at that recipe and it called for instant coffee crystals. Right. And I thought, if only they had asked for, coffee, for ground coffee, I yeah. could have that. But in fact, coffee crystals are now maybe a specialty product. The, the, it, de it depends who you're asking, and I think this is this, these are these kind of dilemmas that we constantly have. What do people have at home? What do they expect, yeah. and how does it work? And, and then you have to dissolve the co coffee. Coffee seems yeah. completely innocuous, you know, but the coffee isn't because yeah. well, how could you measure the intensity of an espresso? One cup of espresso is very different from another. This yeah. is why coffee granules are much easier to work with in a, in a big baking recipe because, oh, because you, you know how much water That's you added right. to how much coffee. Yeah. So all these consider considerations come into play when you test the recipe, but it takes time. This is why we're going into five, six, seven trials with this cake, yes. and we're still not getting it right. No, right? I mean, and then I would submit it, what I think would a recipe that works really well, and then the tester would say, well, I can't be bothered to ground the cardamom. And I would say, well, if you really want the best flavor, you grind the cardamom. <laughs> and she would say, well, if you really want people to make this cake, don't ask, don't ask them to grind the cardamom. <laughs> so there's a sort of a kind of ongoing conversation, and then we somehow come to a truce of some kind. Usually, your time is a diplomat, so usually it involves him. Oh, so I was going to say, do you, do you ever bump up against each other's insistence on one way of doing things? I think Helen is right in the sense that um, there are more than just us, two of us involved in the, pro in the process. So we have our, uh, I have a little team in the test kitchen trying recipes, and then we have the outside testers, which is the people that we, once we're really happy, completely happy with the recipe, we send it out to someone who tests it at home. And that particular woman has uh, got the history of working with Otolenghi recipes. She knows what to expect and how we, I, I want my f the feedback to come back. And, um, and then we would, we, you, can have a, you can have a conversation once you've got it back. And when there is a clash or when it doesn't quite work out, then you do need to be, I'm, I am the diplomatic one. I'm the kind of, I'm trying to find, the, I'm the one who tries to find the middle ground when things are not quite clear as to what's the way forward. I'm the prima donna that says, <laughs> yeah. no, I want this in it. <laughs> Can you, so is there, is there a recipe or more than one where you kind of put your foot down and said, no, your tongue, it has to be this way? Often. <laughs> 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 I think, yeah, it happens. Look, well, I've lost one battle. Which one? Which was the carrot cake. Oh, the carrot ah, cake. Yeah. So, yes, I... <laughs> so there's no carrot cake in the book. There's no... Oh, you lost no, the battle that you we, won. I lost the battle completely. No, but, I, uh, but I won it I in another way. Because, because, <laughs> because in a way, we don't have a carrot cake because we couldn't agree. Well, your tongue's idea of a carrot cake is sort of light. I think it's called a Swiss carrot cake. It has nut meal, it has folded egg whites, it's sort of... Um, it's fluffy. Fluffy. Okay. And my idea of carrot cake is dense and fruity, and never the twain shall meet. <laughs> but this so is we, why we have a parsnip cake and a beetroot cake. We have a parsnip cake. cake. <laughs> <laughs> we both agree that it's great, and so we solved the dilemma there. That okay. Way. 
but of course, the other option would have been to provide both in the rest, both recipes, or perhaps yeah. it's a chance for book number two. Yeah, well, that's yeah. what Maybe. we're thinking. Yes. Yeah, you're reading <laughs> our mind. Um, so I, I want to come back to something you said, Helen, about building on other people's recipes, because there's such a primacy placed nowadays in the food world on originality and uniqueness yeah. and yeah. and every chef kind of wanting to have an absolute signature. And in some ways, you, Yotam, have built a, a real, um, an amazing reputation for having something that really is a twist. It's an Otolenghi twist. And yet you're very clear in the book when you're building on, as you mentioned, let's say Rose Levy Berenbaum's um, recipes, um, one of the uh, wonderful dishes that I got to enjoy at the behest of Brian, who's out there in the audience somewhere. Thank you so much for making this incredible fruit galette, which has a cream cheese pastry, which I'd never heard of. And you're very clear in the head note or somewhere saying, we built on Rose Levy Berenbaum's cream cheese uh, pastry dough. That's like the beginning. And I thought that was both generous and brave and also um, unusual in the world of most creative arts where people want to say, this is mine and you will never be able to do. Well, I think originality for originality's sake is dangerous. <laughs> you know, it leads you to create things because you want to put a mark or be famous or whatever. And I think we prioritize satisfaction, fulfill fulfillment over eating as something good, enjoyment over originality. But, but, but by our nature, or more particularly your tum's nature, is to kind of push the envelope a little bit. And your tum is a, sort of a bit irreverent, probably because he doesn't have this sense of tradition in, in cakes. I'm much more, he's bolder, let's see. So I like to start with a recipe that I know works, that is, has a very, it's technically sound. That's very important to me. And I will take it to Yotam, and usually he will make a few suggestions. And, and sometimes he will infuriate me, but nine <laughs> times out of ten, it, w it will be what makes it, what we call, it, it otolengasizes it. And, uh, and Wait, you have to repeat that verb? What is it? Otolengasize. Uh, otolengasize. Okay. Or otolengify. You can, otolengify. You oh, yeah, that's probably a little <laughs> easier to say. And I don't think he means to do that, but I think his, his nature is just to want a little surprise. And, and I find that with my work, I'm constantly straddling this line between um, the, the exotic and the familiar, because you don't want something so exotic. People don't want, people want comfort with food, but they- Especially with cakes. Especially yeah. with cakes, because there's a whole culture and tradition and grandmother's cakes and, and all of that. But we also want a little surprise. You love surprises. Yeah, I, I, for me, I think it's always been the case that I wanted to um, create some kind of, um, yeah, a surprise, I guess, is, the best, is the, best, the best description of it. Something that is a bit unfamiliar in the process. It doesn't need to completely alienate you. Of course, it has yes. to be within the, within the range of things that we love to eat and give us comfort. But a bit of uh, something surprising, whether a spice that you wouldn't quite expect in this particular context, or something about the texture, or something about the structure of the dish. And I think um, what, with baking, uh, you could do this, but you can do it on the periphery. I think with, you know, we were talking about core recipes, and then you, were, you mentioned the galette. I mean, that is a really, really great recipe uh, uh, for pastry. Uh, so it takes just, a lot of so work to make it. Can you describe so, what so a galette, a, galette it, is? A galette is, a, is like a free-form tart or, or pie, more. more it's, uh, a it's a better face. It's a better, yeah. So, it's an, so you take the, your pastry, your dough, and you, you roll it out and you fill it up with normally with fruit, but there's other variations, and then you fold it back on, a, on in the middle. So it's a pie without the dish. And, um, and essentially this particular recipe that has cream cheese in it, and it's quite a kind of a, a, a lengthy process in the sense that you need to rest it properly and do it in a few stages, really yields a wonderful pie or galette crust. But so you can, you can, of course, you can experiment with pie, with with pastry, and we do constantly experiment. But actually, it's about the filling, it's about the context, it's about how what how you serve it and what shape you give it. There's a lot of things you do around the uh, the periphery that really make it original, and you don't need to start. I mean, a pound cake is a pound cake. It's mm -hmm. equal amounts of you know of sugar, eggs, and flour, and um, and sugar and flour. But but when you when you are when you want to be original. You look at the others, at the, at, the, at the things that adorn it, at the, at the garnishes. Right. But going back to the galette, I mean, the pastry is great, and that's Rose's recipe. But what we also did was to 
have this idea of sprinkling some ground almonds on the bottom before the fruit is laid on top. And not just almonds, I have to say, I mean, the, the recipe, amaretti. I was going to say, amaretti cookies, which yeah. are this intense hit yeah, of almonds. Exactly. And, that, and that's the thing that kind of Well, that serves two purposes because it does have that flavor hit, but it also absorbs the liquid as the fruit is baking. So it seems like a small touch, but for me, it makes the difference between, I mean, it's a great base, but we build on that. Yeah. And I think that is a worth, worthwhile addition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. I can attest first, first hand. Um, so um, in addition to this notion of, of building originality on the, on the great work of other um, sort of core foundational recipes, um, there's this tension I find in baking uh, between um, precision and spontaneity. Mm. And I'm wondering if you could, either of you really could talk about that because mm -hmm. this is, you're involved yeah. in a creative endeavor and yet you have to be absolutely rigorous yeah. with. And, and I think that we worked really hard to find in every recipe in the book, what was the non-negotiable, what was it that needed to be done, the kind of precision for it to be a successful bake. And then we give little notes, like if you don't have blueberries, use this. If you don't have um, ground almonds, do that. You or know, if you don't want to do the icing, you want to just have the cake naked, it's also fine. I mean, yeah. I think often uh, what puts some people off it, but with, with baking is the stuff that goes after the cake is baked. You know, the whole stuff that involves a palette knife and, uh, and, and involves spreading things on top of it. And often it's absolutely fine. It, does, it shouldn't put you off baking if you don't like you know, the, 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 the work that goes after the actual process. So um, like Helen said, we wanted to make sure that people find their own way into bakes. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. It's not just, there isn't just one way, there's various ways. And variations are always much easier for people to, to, to appreciate or to fathom because you could personalize it a bit. And I think, the act of personalizing is great, but it's just deciding when you can personalize. Yes. You can't yeah. just decide to put two, two you know, to, you know, the, to reduce Leave the number of the number of eggs by half. <laughs> it's not going to rise. You know, that, it's not going to happen. That's the way I bake, and it, <laughs> <laughs> it does not work. Are there particular recipes in in the book that you can point to that are that are mm. more appropriate for the improvisatory, spontaneous? I mean, <laughs> for you. For me. Yeah, for yes. You. Um, <laughs> Well, maybe not if you go to half eggs, but <laughs> what we do love, well, one of the cakes that we've been sort of demonstrating um, during our book tour is what we call a rolled pavlova. And it's um, what we love about that. We see I love how a pavlova is getting applause <laughs> here in the house, right? We, we see it as a blank canvas. Um, so in the book, it's with peaches and blackberries, um, but uh, it's been quite autumnal in London the last few weeks and we've made, uh, we've switched it to plums and we've added some cinnamon and, and a sort of sprinkling of almonds. So it's this idea that you can um, choose the fruit that you like, choose the sort of look that you like. Uh, if you like a more tropical flavor, you might have mango in it, and, but maybe grate some lime zest or uh, have some uh, sort of more tropical flavoring, or even ginger in the cream. And so that's where you can play around with it. But we give you the basics so that um, you can play around. And, and so how, how important do you feel is um, technique and mastery of technique? I, I just came off of making a documentary with Jacques Pepin, who mm -hmm. calls cooking the art of adjustment. And at the same time, he's very, very clear that um, Technique is not something that's really optional. It, it, you will always need to use it and you will always need to get better. And I think oftentimes people are maybe scared of baking because it re seems to require more technique or technical mastery because of the hand precision. And I'd love to hear that either argued with, disabused, yeah, dismissed. I, I think it, it just depends on your definition of technique. So technique is everything, even just make, you know, whisking eggs is technique. And, and there are just uh, recipes that are more technically challenging and other that are less. And we really tried to create a whole range of recipes in the book to cater for different people's levels of com how comfortable they are with particular techniques. So. Um, at the end of the book, there is, a check, uh, there's a set, there is a section called confectionery, where in many of the recipes you need to cook sugar to a certain temperature, and you use a sugar thermometer. It's not rocket science, but it's something that you need to feel quite comfortable to do. 
But, uh, but the beginning of the book starts with biscuits and cookies. Those are technically, I think, quite simple to do. So, of course, you need to master a certain technique, but the level of expertise on how much you want to, to, um, to push yourself is completely up to you. And I think you can, the most delicious things often are the simplest ones. Uh, you know, there is a lemon and poppy seed cake that Helen always quotes as one of her favorites in the book. It really, technically, it doesn't require you mm anything really I mean you melt your butter and you mix it up with the eggs and there's no there isn't really much whisking going on so sometimes you need to decide how much you're gonna you know cream your butter and sugar before you add the eggs but this one is literally just mixing everything together pouring into a tin and baking and it's one of the most satisfying uh, cakes so I think I see technique as the sort of line drawing before you paint or before you you know go on to sort of do other forms of art it's the basis and then you can really enjoy it so, I mean, I find if you, you know, reading a recipe and kind of getting a kind of mind, a roadmap of, of what you're doing and understanding whether it's a creaming technique or a beating technique, instantly you, you sort of have a path to, to, to what you're doing. And then you can actually enjoy the process rather than thinking, oh, gosh, what am I doing next? And sort of tearing around the kitchen, right. you know, so. Um, you mentioned earlier about the idea that, that uh, desserts or cakes in particular are there to give comfort and people don't want to necessarily encounter things that are quote unquote exotic. But you know, exotic depends on what your own background or experience is. Yes, true. Um, and I noticed that you, uh, for example, Helen, it, it, uh, incorporated a number of very interesting flavors, flavor profiles from your experience living uh, and growing up in a Malaysian or Malaysian Chinese family. Yes. Um, so t t tell me a little bit about how that works in, a, in a, what is mainly a kind of Western dessert yeah. book. Sure. I mean, what, so the, the recipe that comes to mind when you say that is the pineapple tarts. And um, in, in uh, the Chinese culture, Chinese New Year, it's, it's sort of like the mince pie. Um, <laughs> I don't, actually, I don't know if Americans have that tradition. Oh, yes. Mince pie, right. yes. Oh, yes. So it's the sort of Chinese equ uh, equivalent of mince pie. And it has, um, it's flavored with cloves, star anise, and pandan leaves, usually. What are pandan leaves? Pandan leaves, um, it's like a blade of grass, and we, we call it the vanilla of the East. It's what, in a lot of Asian cooking, um, that is the flavor. It's subtle, but it's, you know, you, you, it just lends a, a, a certain sort of aroma to it. Um, but on the other hand, so in, in the book we, we say, you know, traditionally it's made with pandan and we give the recipe with pandan, but we also say if you don't have it or if you don't want to look for it, you can substitute a vanilla bean. Mm. So it's not, it doesn't make or break it. it. You know, we like to think that we're giving something of the, the best of its kind, but actually it's not a disaster if, if, if it isn't in there. And has some of Helen's um, East Asian or Southeast Asian influences helped you, I mean, have you learned to I expand your own flavor profile, which is already very adventuresome? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Helen has been teaching me a lot of things over the years. They're not all involved, and they sugar. don't all involve sugar. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, for, for, if one of her uh, great contributions is she actually taught me how to love tofu, because I started off really not liking tofu, because uh, I had really bad experience and bad treatments of tofu. I think uh, before I discovered it, I've, the only uh, uh, times I've tried tofu was in certain health food shops, being really dull and bland and gray and not re in, in all sorts of stewy stuff. And uh, traveling with Helen in Malaysia, I've seen it being prepared properly. I even sh been shown how to make it and then fried, marinated and fried and given the crust that you want to give it. And I mean, it's a whole art form to, to cook and enjoy tofu. So I learned that from Helen and through other, a few other Malaysian friends that, that we share. Um, and with, the, with baking, of course, pandan is a really, really great way to infuse flavor, but also, you know, using things like uh, pineapple, and uh, things that are very particular to, to Malaysian culture. And, and you're right to point out that this book, although it does feature flavors from my Middle Eastern background, from Helen's uh, Southeast Asian background, it is really tr uh, quite, um, well, quite rooted in, in Western baking traditions, you know, in European, Australian, North American baking traditions. Whenever we brought our flavors in, it was just as a, as a flavor rather mm. than as a technique. There's no baklava recipe or steamed uh, no Malaysian, steamed Malaysian uh, cakes. cakes. No babka. No, no babka in this one, no. We leave that for... <laughs> well, <laughs> there was one in Jerusalem, but yeah. <laughs> right. Um, the baking 
uh, at least right now in the U.S., is still um, a huge thing that people do in families, with families. Um, are there, it, it, would you call this, are there family-friendly things that you can point to um, in, in the book or things that are good for kids to kind of jump in on? There's a lot. I mean, in a sense, was we, when we um, worked on the book, we tried to create this almost, I, I call it curate, maybe it sounds a bit presumptuous, but it is kind of getting all, everything to work together in a certain way. So there's the grown-up recipes, and they would have coffee and alcohol, and they were quite complicated, flavor complex. And there's things that are much simpler. And I think it's the, uh, with kids, it's the simpler palate that you want to satisfy. It's not so much about they can eat anything really, but, um, uh, but they, there is a certain level of simplicity that kids enjoy. So in the biscuit or cookie section, you know, there's, we just try those speculas cookies, which mm. are sl slightly spiced almond, uh, with, uh, top with almond cookies. They're really good for children. Or the, or the shortbread cookies, or certain cakes, like we talked about um, Rose's um, marble cake mm. or, or pound cake. Uh, there is one kitty-friendly, uh, one that's got a bit of, um, and normally we don't use coloring, but in this recipe we have a bit of pink coloring, so it's the marbles, uh, so it's in, like a Neapolitan f a flavor combination of chocolate, vanilla, and, um, and, and red, whatever that is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> strawberry, but there's no strawberry there, obviously, uh, swirled together. So it's, uh, it's those kind of cakes that really yield themselves to either cooking with kids or mostly just feeding them. Because when you cook with kids, normally it's a complete mess. Disaster. You get You get nothing, <laughs> you get nothing done. The idea really. is usually better than the reality. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also like to deconstruct some recipes. So my sons absolutely love crepes. You know, they will eat it for breakfast every morning if they could. And we have a recipe. It's a blintz, really. Um, but I wouldn't go the whole hog by you know, doing the cream cheese and roasting figs for them, but I would give them with, you know, a slick of Nutella on it. And there's a Knickerbocker Glory, which you can make for a dinner party, which is amazing. It's a ice cream layered with fruit and cream and caramelized nuts. But I wouldn't do that for them, but I may, might make the ice cream when I have lovely raspberries, and they love that. So, I, you know, you don't have to do the whole um, thing. You can find bits that you like and, and um, deconstruct it. That so you both come li live in the country that has given us the Great British Bake Off or the Great <laughs> British Baking Show, which, which, as we all know, was like the highest rated show of any kind really? on the BBC. Is that right? uh, yes, and it was very, very, very popular here. Right. It's really quite extraordinary. Right. Does um, do you have any thoughts on whether that show has helped, you know, popularize? Baking, or whether it's made everything now sort of every, everyone feels they need to be a professional, you know, um, decorator or icer, um, because it's it's also really popular here, and yeah. it's, a, it's a very lovely, comforting, sweet show in these times. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it has a really nice outcome yeah. every week. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's a great show, also in the landscapes of shows, not only politics, because. Um, <laughs> It's, you know, TV shows have, have turned very competitive, and although this is a competition, it's a very nice competition. It is, yeah. Uh, it's very collaborative. Uh, you, we, you can watch it with children, and there's no chance that anyone will be kind of hurt or go to bed crying for any, any kind of <laughs> reason. And uh, it really, it has really popularized baking in the UK to a degree that we haven't yeah. really seen. So I'm, I, 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 I always say that I've really, I'm quite surprised when you go to, a, at you kind of the average uh, British supermarket at the moment, the baking section is really remarkably well stocked. You know, you've got the glucose syrup and you've got all the icings and you've got all the levels of chocolate and nuts, etc. and even the, the baking tins and the equipment. So all of a sudden, the baking section has really ballooned in, in supermarkets. And it's a great thing to see because, I mean, baking is such a wonderful thing. It's such a great tradition. It's, a, it's something that goes back a long time. It's where families get together. It's really the most um, special um, way of being, creating a family activity together. And it's nice to see that it's being done. It's really the most harm, harmless way of spending time together, <laughs> isn't it, baking a cake? So it's, it's rather special. Except maybe when there's fights going on in the kitchen. Is it possible for you two to actually literally uh, bake side by side, or is that really something that needs to be done? 
separately. We've done a bit of that recently because we've had a few sort of demos and, and little <laughs> video shoots. And How's actually, that gone? We, 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 okay. uh, we, it's boring, but we get along <laughs> remarkably well. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to throw in a little tantrum here and there, but it just, it somehow, we, 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 it's somehow, it, I find working with your Tom is like sort of choreography. We, we anticipate each other. Um, it's quite harmonious. I, I'm, I'm, now I feel really nervous Jim, saying that. I'm going to jinx <laughs> What's it. What's going to go wrong, <laughs> wrong next time? Something will. Um, you, you've developed this extraordinary um, world, mainly in the UK, with your um, shops and restaurant and, of course, the, the publishing and the books, the articles. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been asked when I've said, when I've come back from London, said I've eaten one of your restaurants or... People say, oh, does he have a restaurant in the States? <laughs> so I, I'm sure... It's good you, you're asking that, question because we're going to have questions from the audience. This is yeah. normally the number one or two questions. <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> that comes up. We'll get it out of the way now. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and it's not just a question of will you. It's, it, it, it really, it's more of a question of how much, how big can a chef's or creative person's empire be b before you start to feel that it's really not yours anymore? Yeah. It's a real... Um, it's a, it's a dilemma, a, a conundrum that we, we, uh, we're co constantly discussing. I mean, um, I'm the face of the company, but it's a partnership, really. There's Sammy, Noam, and Cornelia. We're four core partners running the company together. And that has helped us expand because each one has an area of responsibility. Uh, but we've only expanded in London so far. And it's, but we have been talking in the, over, the, over the years of how we could, if possibly, maybe come, open a restaurant in another part of the world. And so far, we haven't find, found the formula, because it, I think it is a formula. It's, in a restaurant, anyone who's worked in the food industry knows that every, in every food outlet in the world, something goes wrong every day. Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, some things haven't been, you know, de delivered. The, fridge broke down, someone's fallen ill, someone's had a fight, um, the croissants, the humidity is too high, so the croissants are, are not proving properly, etc., etc. And you need to deal with all these things all the time, otherwise the standards start yeah. to slip. And this is, and to deal with that, you need to, f to have a system, and our system is not very efficient, we just go and deal with it. <laughs> and it's <laughs> and uh, it's very difficult to to do when you're f far removed from the from the thing. So it's uh, we're still asking ourselves whether it, whether it will ever be possible. I mean, years go by and we still haven't opened a, a restaurant in in America. But who knows? Maybe one day. And Helen, you've have you ever been tempted to uh, do that? Do the restaurant that actually be on the production line? I was foolish enough when I had no experience to open my own cafe. <laughs> um, and it was the best and the worst thing I've ever done. This was in Melbourne? This or was where? in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. So when I left the um, pharmaceutical company and was rejected by the catering company, <laughs> I thought, well, I'll have to... Uh, well, actually, it was a longer story. My partner at the time had um, a, 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 what you call a redundancy package. He was able to sort of leave work for a, a sort of lump sum of cash and he said you know if you had this sum of money what would you do and I said I would open a cafe of course <laughs> and so we opened a cafe he had no experience either but we worked our butt off and we I, I guess my cakes were singled out as being kind of special and kind I, of special. <laughs> kind of special. And, well we, we how, had a journalist you, come. How did that happen? I mean what did, yeah well I who, who I, noticed it? Who noticed it? Um uh, you know, I just put my head down and just sort of really try to learn and really try to perfect the cakes. And one day, a journalist who was um, a food writer, actually, he had come in to taste the, uh, well, an array of cakes. And I didn't really, I think I was too busy and too sort of frazzled to sort of take much notice of it. But I remember one Sunday, the store was closed on Sunday and Monday, and I remember one Sunday sitting across uh, on a bench looking at my store, and I lived above the store at the time, with my head in my hands, thinking, I don't know how I'm going to get up and work tomorrow. I'm so tired. And this man, uh, 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 he had a murder mystery bookstore <laughs> down the road. He comes running out and waves this paper at me. And there's my face in the front of the paper. It was a Sunday paper. 
and with this title, World's Best Chocolate Cake, with my little face on it. I thought, gosh. And I never slept after that because <laughs> it was a very small cafe. I would um, make cakes round the clock, you know, sort of six in the oven, set the alarm. And it's a cake that takes quite a long time to cook. It's in the book. Um, I would put them in the oven, set the timer for an hour and a half, take a nap, come back down another <laughs> and another. So, you know, this went on and then I decided actually this couldn't continue. So I, we sold the business and uh, that was when I decided, you know, it was great, but I really want proper training. So I, I then went to train properly after that. So I sort of yes. did it the, the you know, wrong way around in a way. But, uh, the, but the, cake, the, the cake and the, pas the passion for that particular chocolate cake that has persisted, the, the version that you have in the book is they're small, right? Um, is that the, is that the, is that the we chocolate have, cake we're talking no, about? No, we have a, couple, a few chocolate cakes in the book. The one we have is a, a kind of medium size. Okay. It's called a take, take Home Chocolate Cake. Take Home Chocolate Cake. And uh, that was the one that Helen mentioned. What do you think it was that, that, that got it that moniker of world's best? Um, I think at the time when it was, there was a, a, a lot about sort of chocolate fudge cakes. It, it's neither fudgy nor is it spongy. It's somewhere in the middle. And I think also it's very easy to make uh, all of those factors. It's easy, but it takes a while. You say it, it takes well, a while. Well, the cooking takes a while, but it's, it's literally you make it in one bowl. Uh, you don't need a machine. Uh, it's, it's, it all goes into one bowl. The, 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 the thing is waiting for it to cook. It takes quite a long time. So as long as we're talking about chocolate, I wanted to um, ask you to defend probably the only food stuff that I don't like, <laughs> and that is white chocolate. <laughs> I, don't um, think you're, I don't think you're on your own with that. <laughs> yeah. uh, why is it even called chocolate? It's basically like Crisco with vanilla. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's true. And yet you have white chocolate recipes mm -hmm. in the book, so I'm, I, I don't mean to be facetious. I really yeah. do want to yeah, know. Do. What am I missing? You know, I had exactly the same... Um, uh, sentiment with, with that. And when we started collating the, uh, recipes for the book, I hadn't eaten, I must admit, the whole of all our cakes. There were certain cakes that I just had an antipathy towards, and our white chocolate cheesecake was one of them. I just <laughs> thought, white chocolate cheesecake, it was just sort of felt really cloying to me. But I know that it was a popular cake that our customers love it, and I had to test it for the book. And when I tested it, I thought, this is amazing. I <laughs> loved it. Because actually, there's no sugar in it. The white chocolate sort of contributes that um, sort of mellow sweetness. And then you've got the slightly salty che uh, cream cheese. So uh, that kind of converted me. I would, I would never eat a bar of white chocolate, but I think in the context that, that Helen uh, describes it, it really does work with cream. For instance, when you make a white chocolate ganache and then um, fall through whipped cream, it does create something quite special that you can't mm. get just with sugar because it gives it the stability of a ganache, you know, where we, like a proper chocolate ganache yes. and the richness. Yes. And you really, like Helen said, you don't need to add sugar because it's so, sh it's so sweet. And it's, it's pretty special. There is a recipe in the book for a, for a celebration cake which has a white chocolate ganache. Yes. And, and in that context, if you try it, you might be converted yourself. Actually, there's one, there's one other, um, Peter, and I think if, if there was one thing that might convert you, it's th there's, a, there's a, an oat and cranberry biscuit, which and on its own, it's actually really very satisfying. But then if you put a coat of white chocolate in it, it becomes really special, and even I love that. You've got that <laughs> sort of sharp hit of the cranberries, and then you've got that chocolate that just makes it all sort of luxurious. And it's really lovely. You're going to try? Uh, yeah, and I, well. Br no, <laughs> Brian, no, are you Brian, listening? Brian is going to try. <laughs> <laughs> I will report back next yeah, time you visit. Well, exactly. Um, well, I think on that note, and there may be some white chocolate defenders in, in the house. I didn't mean to single it out. And maybe, you, maybe there are varieties of white chocolate that I'm not, maybe there's actually quality grades that I haven't <laughs> discovered yet. I don't know. Um, but on that note, it would be great to start hearing some of your questions about recipes, about baking, about. Um, about whether Paul Hollywood should have left the BBC or not. <laughs> I know there are the strong opinions out question. there. Um, there are, uh, I think Jordan and Maggie have mics, and Yotam and Helen are here to take your questions, so we'll First start. First question is right here. Okay. On your right. Oh. 
Can you stand up? Thanks. So you talked a lot about um, simplifying and making things uh, accessible for people. I'm someone who has allergies, so I'm wondering if you factor that in at all. Um, so with, with uh, the, the beauty of it is that we never uh, set out to, um, to, to, to create recipes that are particular for particular uh, work for particular allergies, but we do have recipes that are uh, nut free and gluten free. But we we there is so many specialized cookbooks these days that do those particular things, and we had a core r set of recipes that that deal with those. So we we single out and we mention this is gluten free, this is nut free in in those particular cases. But we haven't dealt with those with each particular allergy with with a set of recipes because uh, there there is. Yeah, like I said, there's tons of books that do that, and there's great recipes around for that, and we just wanted to showcase our, our recipes. Can I follow up? Yeah? So I used to live in London. Oh, sorry. I used to live in London right around the street from the Upper Street location, and I would go in and like look at things, but I could never eat anything because like the staff would be like, you can't eat here. Um, so <laughs> did they I'm, really say that? Yeah. What did you what, what, What's your allergy? I'm allergic to peanuts and nuts, uh -huh. um, and like legumes and stuff. So I can't even eat the non-baked goods. But that's mm -hmm. another thing. Um, so I'm wondering, even in the kitchens, do you think about, you know, cross contamination or like I know there's a lot of specialized um, nut-free baking, for example, but. You know, for someone who wants to eat at a place that's like Adelangi. Yeah. I, I mean, we take that very seriously. And I think it's this idea that if we were to do that, it would change the nature of a lot of our, a lot of our cakes. And that way, we, we kind of need the serving one purpose or another. And I think we'd, we'd rather sort of not claim to anything like that and leave people who really are passionate and specialize in that to, to do that. Yeah. If you have a serious nut allergy, then just tiny amount of, yes. of nuts would, would, and that's a huge responsibility yes. for us, then we can't have any nuts in our kitchen. The next question is on your left. Hi. Um, oh, sorry, we're going to just sort of bounce. Um, I'm kind of curious to hear about how uh, your savory process uh, differs from the process with making baked goods. Hmm. The savory for making cakes? Uh, no, maybe I think the, the, the process savory of developing savory recipes, recipes versus sweet recipes. Um, I think we kind of touched on it on various points of the conversation. I think with the sweet recipes, you, of, we, you often start with a recipe that you know as a starting point for a recipe. So you, uh, if it's a cake or if it's a biscuit, you, you have a there is a core set of recipes that are there, and we and uh, you know particular. Uh, pastries or sponges or, or, or cookie recipes, and then we work with them in combination or with flavors. With a savory recipe, there is a bit less of that kind of rigidity. You, 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 there is something that you, you like and you know how it works, and then you work around it. But, but, but essentially, those are just, the, those are kind of techni technical things. At the end, it, at the end, it all boils down to, to flavor and how that works. And this is the moment that it becomes really interesting is when you taste. And then it's, you know, it's everybody's idea of what's good. And I always like to taste food in a group, uh, not on my own. At least two or three people um, uh, giving their idea of what, what they like, what works for them, and what doesn't. I think it's really, really important because if you do it singularly, uh, often you get in a rut. I find myself getting myself in a rut when I try something and I liked it a bit earlier and I, I, I'm not sure I like it anymore. And it depends on how full you are, what you had earlier, etc. When you have a group of people, you get a really good idea of, of what works and the conversation is very productive. Is that for you as well, Helen? I mean, you obviously cook really well no matter whether it's a sweet or not. Um, do you find that sort of iterative process with other people uh, helpful? Um, I think your time's probably more open to it than, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't mind taking it to them when I feel I've, I'm not going to get any criticism. I'm too sensitive. I can't, do, I can't handle it. 
<laughs> so I like to get it to the point where I'm almost certain people will like it. Maybe they'll add one or two suggestions, but I don't like it being really criticized, so. <laughs> okay. The next question is on your right. So I'm Indian and I use a lot of spices in my cooking, as you do in yours, and I was wondering what is your favorite spice and why? <laughs> this is such a difficult question um, because um, Spices are really, really need a context, right? Like, so for in cakes, if you look at this book, you'd find like a, you'd find re, uh, spices that keep on um, appearing in various recipes. So we use a star anise, or we use cardamom, or vanilla if you want to call it a spice, or cinnamon. There's, there's, or allspice. There's spices that really lend themselves really nicely to savory. In fact, to sweet we have a cooking. cake that's called spice cake. And we've got the spice is, cake. Yeah. Which has a lot of spices. A lot, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah a lot. Yeah. Did you try that one? No, no. I haven't, but I looked okay. at the recipe. You did, yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a test, by the way. <laughs> I was just interested. <laughs> so, uh, um, and that said, I mean, one gravity, obviously everyone has a flavor profile. You're, you've become famous for, in, in some ways, geographically shifting ever eastward. And as I was thinking, when you came here last time, you'd become very famous for Mediterranean spices and flavor profiles, and you were then, at that point, really exploring and embracing Iranian and Indian. True. And now, perhaps with Helen's influence, yeah. turning ever eastward. And even with Scully, who's mm. been my co-author on the previous book, on the Nopi Cookbook, who's mm. also got, comes from that background, it's been very much a process of, 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 um, of discovering the spices. And I think spices are actually, um, I find it more, more illuminating to look at them as, as in groups rather than as individuals. So you can find cumin in India and you can find cumin in the Middle East and in North Africa, but they do very different things mm. with cumin. And I really think it's very, it's, it's, it's very instructive to look at them as a, as a group, you know, in, uh, often in Indian cooking, I mean, you probably know much more than I do, cumin is, is uh, associated, um, you know, with cardamom, with chili, with, uh, with um, turmeric, with uh, coriander, asafoetida, you know, a bunch of spices. So though I kind of see those spices as a, as a group, and they really kind of symbol... So when I, when I think Indian cooking, I've got that kind of in my, in my mind, rather than singular ones, because singular spices are... Are, um, they travel very easily between cultures, I think. Mm. Mm. It's the groups that identify yeah. cultures. Yeah. It's how you combine them. Yeah. Mm. The next question is up here on your left. Hi, I was wondering, uh, what is it like in the kitchen, for example, when there's like a heavy crowd and how do you handle tough situations like that? <laughs> a, cr heavy crowd. a heavy crowd. How do you handle a heavy crowd in the kitchen? Do you mean in the restaurant kitchen or at home? Because The restaurant kitchen. Ah, okay. It's uh, like ballet, isn't it? It's yeah. like chore it's choreography. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very difficult. You know, the, you've worked in really busy kitchens. It's, it's, it's something you learn. It's, how to deal with, right? You learn, Physically. and I think a good kitchen, somehow the different people move in ways where you have to be very sensitive to what other people are doing as well. And also, there's, a, there's hot pans involved, so you've got to be <laughs> very mindful and, very, uh, and, and, and have a kind of peripheral vision, almost. Yeah, a good sense of personal space, yes. because there's a lot of that going on, and if people are just kind of marching on to where they want to get and not appreciating what's going on, it's become, it becomes quite difficult. Well, it seems the, be the best kitchens, the best run kitchens, unlike the kind of uh, reality show mm. um, stereotype, are not ones where people are screaming or yeah. chefs are losing their temper. It's absolutely silent. You yeah. go into the kitchen yes, of, a, of exactly. Thomas Keller um, or Daniel Boulou yeah. and people know what they're doing, they know what they're about, and that's not to say they're slow, they're moving no, very it's fast. No, it's absolutely true. There's it's, a focus to yeah. it. Yeah. People know what they're doing, that's the key answer, because yeah. if people don't know that what, what they're doing, that starts to go wrong and people need to raise their voices, but mostly when people know what they're doing, it works quite seamlessly, or at least that's time, how it needs to work. I was just thinking of my time when I managed the Kensington store, which was a tiny little, little store, and there were four or five boys, very young boys, half my age, and they would be, you know, Eminem or, and Fat Boy Slim, I think was the music at the time, and that would be blasting. But you'd see them, the rhythm of the night, just chopping to this Eminem, you know, like this. 
<laughs> and, uh, you know, it was sort of quite frenetic, but actually there was a real um, peace with it too. It wasn't, it was, somehow they were in the, in the yeah. rhythm and, and that was a really beautiful thing. I see another product line, Ottolenghi mixtape. It ha could happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's novel. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> another one. The next question's on your right over here. Oh. Hi, I've been really inspired by a lot of your flavor combinations, and I wonder, from either one of you, what have you been surprised by yourselves? The ingredients, not so much spices, but putting two things together. If you've been delighted by anything that you've... I know one from this particular book, because um, we, there is this uh, chocolate pudding that you did with the oh, lime. with the lime. Yeah, yes. and I never thought that chocolate and lime worked so well together. I'm, I'm actually not such a big fan of mixing chocolate with fruit. There are a lot of ex exceptions, but generally I'm, I much prefer to mix chocolate with other things than fruit. And this particular um, dessert, Helen introduced to me, and I, I knew at the beginning that, she's gonna sh that it's got chocolate and lime, and I thought that just doesn't do it for me. Um, but I've been completely happily surprised to be proven that it's just actually one of, one of the best uh, yes, dessert in this delicious. book. It's a really, really rich, beautiful, you can eat it warm or at room temperature uh, with a bit of cream. Uh, it's a pudding, it's a, it's a baked chocolate dessert, but, and it's got a bit of lime and it just works really wonderfully. Where did that idea, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can you, Helen, where did that idea come from? I'll tell you where it came from, I was reading a novel, I don't remember what, what it was. <laughs> That's and how it works in uh, <laughs> Helen's world. <laughs> Once I get, get a food idea, the novel goes out and I'm just with this idea. And someone was asking uh, about an old-fashioned chocolate bar, which I don't even remember the name. I've never eaten this chocolate bar, but it had lime in it. And why was it phased out? And I also have this thing. I don't like, for example, I don't like strawberries and chocolate. Yeah. Um, so your time oh, and I share that, yeah. but I was intrigued by this person's sort of uh, uh, fanaticism for this, uh, this confection, and I thought, well, I'll try it. I mean, it was once upon a time out there, so someone had the idea. Um, so the, the pudding was a recipe I had in my repertoire that I loved, and, and I know that if I go to your tongue with something, it, it's always better just to have a little something up your sleeve, <laughs> and that was the lime was the something up my sleeve. Yeah, and wow. it inspired it's by that. Brian, take note. Um. <laughs> the next question is on your left. Poor Brian. <laughs> Thank you for all your exceptional work. You've, your work is a true inspiration. And I know a lot of it has been inspired by your family. And I love reading the stories that accompany many of the recipes in your previous books. I'm wondering, many of our baking we do is takes a family recipe and updates it into where you are now. I'm wondering if you'll share with us a recipe that either of you had from your family that you've updated. Oh. Less so for me. I mean, we, my, my mom, uh, my dad doesn't bake and my mom bakes on occasion, but I, I can't say that any of these uh, in particular, but I do have something that my mother used to make and we always talk about it. She used to make a, a sabayon, you know, sabayon is the Italian thing. And, I always find it really magical how three ingredients uh, could yield something so creamy and beautiful, just egg yolks, um, sugar, and, and a, a sweet wine. And uh, this was something that I've always had in my mind. We had a recipe in this book that unfortunately didn't make it, only because it was like the longest recipe <laughs> ever. It was, a, it was my wedding trifle. Uh, Helen oh made a God. trifle for it when I got married to, uh, to Carl. It was made in big it was, vases. She made it in a vase. Like, yeah, but I had no to vase on the no. table. But it was about <laughs> well, as I, big as this soup. I remember when making it, I had to stand on a ladder to <laughs> sort of assemble it. <laughs> and uh, it was... The so trifle like with the soaked yeah, yeah, cookies. So it, was, it was called trifle for a wedding or wedding trifle, and um, there was a layer of sabayon there. It was, it, 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 it still, we still have the recipe, but when we laid the book out, it took about six pages, and we just said, like, <laughs> it's a problem, but it is a really, really delicious. Actually, sort of the picture of it is in the book. Yeah, in one of these collages. Yes, yeah, one yeah, of the yeah. Collages. The picture made it to oh, the book where the recipe we, And we pulled made. it out at the last <laughs> minute. It's great. It's like blooper reel, like when you see a scene that oh, was yeah, actually yeah. edited. <laughs> out. <Okay>. Exactly. <laughs> great. The next question. No, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's okay. The next question's on your right. On the right. Um, hi, I wonder, I don't like 
sweets that are too sweet, and I'm guessing that you don't either, because it covers up the flavor, it becomes cloying. Yeah. And often when I'm baking, I'm tempted to cut the sugar by substantial portions. I mean, especially a lot of American desserts are overly sweet. But I also recognize that there's a textural um, mm. component that comes with sugar and moistening. And so I guess I wonder how you guys dealt with that as you developed recipes. <coughs> It's a great question, particularly because the book is called Sweet. Yeah? Yeah. So, <laughs> no, I, I didn't mean it facetiously. I mean... <laughs> well, I, you know, that's a good point, because when the, when the name of the book was sort of put out there and, and Sweet, and I was in the minority who didn't like the title, because for me the connotation was sickly sweet or too sweet, so because I don't like that. Um, I think we start by structurally how the cake works, how much sugar it takes to, to, to make the cake work, and then we pare it down until it reaches that point. It's kind of chemistry in a way, like Titus, you know? Yeah. Mm. Um, at what point it, does it, the reagent not work? Mm. And, yeah. and, and we're constantly moving and shifting until we get that sweet spot where it works and tastes harmonious. Yeah, and I don't think there's really a rule to, to to answer the question, I think there is really, you need to just test. And obviously people have a high or you know, lower sugar tolerance. You know, some people like it sweeter. Um, and we normally don't want it to be too sweet because, no. like, because it can mask the other flavors. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's just a, a matter. And also sometimes you can reduce one, you can use um, some uh, white sugar and some brown sugar, so you get more depth of flavor with the sugar. So you, playing with sugars and with sweeteners, you could create all sorts of different combinations that work uh, to enhance certain flavors. But we like using fruit a lot. I think fruit with its sort of natural acidity, well, it has, it's sweet as well as, you know, acidic. And I think that they, that's a natural accompaniment to a lot of cakes. And, and as I said before, what we love about that rolled pavlova is that you've got that sweetness and a very subtle cream which doesn't have to be sweetened, and then this acidic sort of fruit. Yeah. And so balance is really important. Right. And I think, as, as you said, if the more you experiment and you realize if you found a, a flavor and sweetness palette that matches yours, then you trust the recipe, right? Yeah. And then if you realize, no, this person actually is always 10% sweeter than I like, then, yes. then you adapt. True. Yes, exactly. The next question is on your left. Hi, um, I often struggle with making my dessert look beautiful, and the photography in this book is so incredible. Do you have any plating tips for a home chef? Plating tips, yeah. You know, your Tom loves I it. Love Sometimes plating. he starts with the plate. <laughs> what, can we, what can we make to put on this plate? <laughs> <laughs> That's happened. <laughs> I do love plates, it's true. And, and platters as well. <laughs> And it goes back to the time when, well, it's still the case, but you know, in our restaurants or in our shops and that, and mainly, uh, food is served on, on, on platters and uh, they really are important to sell the, what we want to sell. They, they're really important. So uh, one of the things that is really important is generosity. The same generosity that you offer in your cake, you want in your, the platter that it sits, sits on. So you don't want to squash it, you know, you want to give things a lot of space. Um, the other thing is bigger is often more beautiful and or smaller, but then in abundance. So um, I don't know if you ever go to shop but, and buy a sandwich. You always notice that the last sandwich, nobody ever buys it. <laughs> uh, it there could be like... 10 there and then they'll sell, but there's going to be two left for the, or one left for the rest of the day. And I think like the big numbers really create a sense of, of generosity and abundance that works visually as well. So if you're making individual cakes, you want to make 10 or 8 and arrange them nicely on a big platter so they sit there close together, they really enhance the, the visuals of, of, the, of the, the whole experience. Um, and with bigger cakes, yeah, slightly bigger cakes makes for much more um, generous appearance. And uh, the other thing that is really important is to create a certain sense of contrast between what you're serving and the platter underneath it. If it's similar colors, it can work, but your better, uh, the better bet is to create some kind of contrast. If the cake is, for instance, black slate, is really complementary to most bakes because everything looks beautiful under bl black. Mm. It's that kind of uh, in, uh, intense, uh, it's like the, the black dress. Uh, so it works also in, uh, in baking, yeah. There's a lot of little tips. A little tips. black plate. <laughs> a little black plate. <laughs> well, actually, the big black, big black plate. 
<laughs> the next question is on your right. Hi, um, this is a bit of a basic question, so apologies if you've answered this a million times, but I'm curious, what are your favorite things to eat, savory or sweet? Uh, the problem is where to start yes. <laughs> with this question. Well, we love to eat Malaysian food together. Yes, we do. Um, or a real sort of ethnic food, the yeah. Malaysian that, food especially. That you both cook or you go out and go find out. I mean, Helen, out usually. Helen makes beautiful Malaysian food. She makes wonderful laksas and, uh, she, uh, or, or um, anything with noodles or rice. You go to Helen and you get the best examples of. Uh, but we do love to go out to Malaysian restaurants because Malaysian <laughs> food is quite a lot of work. And uh, in the, if you go to a Malaysian restaurant, you get the whole spread and you don't need to do it, wash, any washing, washing up. <laughs> so that's kind of nice. Yeah. Um, but my favorite sweet thing to eat, which it's actually in the book, it's called powder puffs. Now, Australians in the audience might know this. It's a really old fashioned cake. I first had it um, decades ago <laughs> um, at a funeral. And it was obviously no place to source recipes at a funeral. <laughs> so I, and I wasn't close to the family of the deceased, but I went to support um, my partner at the time, who, who, knew, who knew these people. And, um, I, you know, I, and then we broke up, so I, that, was, that was the recipe gone. That was a, <laughs> Somebody else had to shame. die in well, order to get it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was in country Victoria, sort of outside of Melbourne. And I remember eating it and thinking, just sort of, I mean, at the time I didn't know that it was called powder puffs, but if you imagine the soft, sort of ethereal quality of eating this, it, it, you, you see exactly why it's called powder puffs. Anyway, I forgot about it, thinking this was just one of those things, you know, some, a grandmother made that I, I, you know, I would never be able to find the recipe. And many, many years later, Stephanie Alexander, a very well-known Australian chef, she had a column in the national paper, and she published a recipe, and it was called Aunt Peggy's Powder Puffs. And something about the Aunt Peggy, which took me to sort of country Victoria, and something about the word powder puffs. I knew instantly that this was the thing I'd eaten 20 years ago. <laughs> and so I followed her recipe duly and, and you know, sifting three times and not over mixing. And it's exactly that product that I ate. <laughs> wow, that's And then we've otolengicized it by putting uh, <laughs> raspberry and rose water Ooh, into it. Raspberry and, and rose it's, water. Wow. And it's one of my favorite things to eat. Yeah. Wow. And the consistency, it's like, is it? Like a meringue? Or well, no. actually, so it starts off, you know, sort of like two Savoadi biscuits, you know, fairly plain. I mean, you'd think, what's the fuss, really? Um, it's a dry sponge biscuit. Mm -hmm. uh, you sandwich it with whipped cream, and you, you need to let it sit for five hours, three to five hours, mm -hmm. by which time the whole thing kind of becomes one. And when you eat it, it really, it, you imagine a powder puff just sort of melting in your mouth. It's exactly like that. It's very nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for two more questions, these two gentlemen here. So, uh, Yatam, I understand that you uh, were on the vanguard of creating the movement of um, modern Israeli cuisine, and then Helen and I know that you have a background in Western, especially Australian uh, patisserie. So I'm wondering if this book seeks to create an Israeli type of patisserie, which I don't think currently exists, and I'm also wondering if your backgrounds clashed at all. <laughs> uh... The background's what? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, you should be sitting here. I yeah. Think. <laughs> um, it's definitely not an Israeli patisserie reinvented or reimagined. Um, because, I mean, I, if I'm completely honest, I haven't lived in Israel for about 20 years. And, um, and there's a lot of things going on with Israeli baking, and I've, I'm aware of it, and I read about it, and I go and experience it when I go. But um, we've been wandering in all sorts of directions. You know, some of them would have kind of bits of the Middle East popping up in, in here and there, or some of them have Asian in, uh, recipes. But most of them are really quite in, international in scope. You know, they, they could find um, their place in various, you know, uh, environments. 
Uh, so, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's, a, it's this kind of rediscovering Israeli cooking, but there isn't really any conflict. I don't think there is conf inherent conflict in, 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 uh, in recipes. You know, it's just what you choose to project onto them, and, and, and we worked really well together. So, uh, so all in all, peace between Israel and Australia <laughs> and everything is, everything is going really well. <laughs> You do have those semolina, the soaked uh, semolina cakes that are the I rose think water the, cake, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's I mean, very Israeli. Really, yeah, yeah, there is some, yeah, yeah. And like I say, there is a bits and pieces of various things, and I think this is part of the joy of what Helen was talking about, of kind of using recipes that are kind of from various backgrounds and playing up with them. So there would there would be some of those. And he snuck tahini in a few things. There is tahini, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did, yeah. There is tahini in a few recipes. Thanks. And the next question is also on your left. Hi. So I was um, wondering, I know there's so many recipes in this book, but I was wondering what would be the recipe or two recipes you recommend we make? Because there are so many and we do not have time to make all of them. So <laughs> is there something, especially I'm part Middle Eastern with Middle Eastern ties that you would recommend um, we make and why? Yeah, well... With Middle Eastern ties, um, I guess, yes, the recipes that have tahini in them are, um, <laughs> I quite like. Um, uh, so there is actually, I can think of two, right? There There's two. two. Uh, one of them is the, the brownie, and it really is a, quite, a, quite a traditional brownie recipe. Uh, all you Americans would, would know how, what that tastes like. Um, but we, we, we added chunks of halva and, and swirls of tahini in it. It's really, really good. <laughs> and uh, and, and, and that's, that's what it is. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing to start with because it's, uh, it's, it's, it features those flavors nicely. And then there is a, there is a, there is a short bread, there is a, a, a bar. We call it uh, Middle Eastern Millionaire's Shortbread, and it's got a, a, a nice layer of uh, short, uh, shortbread, and then halva, and, um, and then on, it's topped with caramel. That is, it's made with tahini, so you make a sugar caramel, and then you, you pour ta a tahini paste inside, and we top it with some, um, some salt. So it's got salt, caramel, tahini, and halva in it, and it's just mm. to die for. And, and Helen, if it, if it, leaving the powder puffs aside, um, what, what dish of your own creation would you be most happy to find that your partner or loving friend or kid had made for you when you walked in after a hard book tour? I mean, having talked about all these flavors and spices, the cake that I return to over and over again is the lemon poppy seed cake. Um, I mean, we've affectionately called it um, National Trust cake because it's sort of, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a simple cake, the kind that you would find in a lot of cafes. I ta you know, I think ours is a very good version, if I can say that. But it's simple. I like a little sweet something with my cup of tea. I mean, I, I, might, I won't eat a whole cake, but just a sort of tiny little <laughs> slice of this with a cup of tea is very satisfying. And I love lemons, and the poppy seed just gives it a slight sort of textural hit. It's the sort of cake I could eat every day and would, would probably eat every day if I and could. And is what, what makes it an Ottolenghi recipe? Good that's question. A, that's not a, that's yeah. not a very Ottolenghi recipe. No. <laughs> In fact, we, so don't, we don't sell it. So perversely, you've chosen the, most, the least Ottolenghi cake. Well, you, you know, I I, I'm, I'm often <laughs> stuck by this idea that, um, and I, I don't want to be verbose or... or, or sort of pretentious in this, but you know you see these fashion shows, these runaways, you, uh, uh, Alexander McQueen or whoever it is, oh no, he's, he's dead, isn't he? Yes, <laughs> Sorry. He <is>. It's okay. <laughs> anyway, his that's label a, still exists. His label though, still yeah. exists. Yeah. You know, they're flamboyant things, they come out the runway, and then the designer comes out, and they're in jeans and a t-shirt. It's kind of, it's, 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 that's my go-to. You know, that's Great. what I love. So we have the little black slate, the little black plate. <laughs> black dress. We've got Alexander McQueen. <laughs> Alexander McQueen and the po lemon poppy seed cake, clearly crossing all oh. kinds of <laughs> boundaries here. Helen Go and Yotam Otolenghi, thank you for your wonderful recipes. Thank you so and much. Great